turn to the uh, second chapter of Micah. We're going to begin there. I believe the next one in, in order, we, we probably take a couple weeks to finish this, but as best I recall, the next one is Zephaniah, but, but uh, I'll let you know next week for sure. <clears throat> as I said last week, uh, Mike is a little different from the others. He, he is more... A combination of uh, sternness and compassion, and it had some of the most sublime uh, comments in this in his book uh, anywhere that you can find uh, in the Bible. So, uh, very good lessons for us, and I, and I certainly appreciate all the prophets and for the fact that in Despite the uh, opposition that they did receive, they continued to prophesy what the Lord had uh, instructed them to do. And we're the beneficiaries of it, and we should be thankful for that. So I'd like to go to our Father in prayer to thank Him for, you know, these things. Should you bow with me, please? Heavenly Father, we thank Thee for Thy Word. We thank Thee for the prophets who spoke so long ago and for the writing that we have that we may learn the lessons of time past and not repeat those errors and that in all things we may remain faithful to thee and and bring honor and glory to our lord jesus christ these things we ask in his name amen <clears throat> and again the problem with uh you know all these prophets they had to deal with that they were uh, preaching against was the idolatry of the people. And it was just... We, I think we have an idolatry today, but it's kind of a different kind. We don't, as far as I know, we don't have wooden images and we don't worship calves. Even though I remember a calf back on the farm that I really didn't like, but <clears throat> I liked it even better after it was in the freezer. <laughs> but uh, we don't have that here today, maybe other parts of the world, but we don't have that here today. But still, there are many things that become uh, our God that we worship instead of the true living God. So in that sense, we still have idolatry today. We have things, material things, that have taken the place of uh, God Almighty. So it says here in chapter 2, Woe to those who devise iniquity and work out evil in their beds. At morning light they, they practice it because it is in their power of their hand. Now these people so evil that, you know, they just, uh, I don't know if they stayed awake at night in their beds thinking about what they can do or they dreamed about it or, but it was just a continual planning to do evil. And they didn't go to bed at night thinking, well, how can I, whatever it is, gain this uh, material item, this land, or how can I gain material wealth through trading? And this, how can I do that? And they, they just think about it. It consumed them. <clears throat> and they had the power to do it. And they practice it in the morning light. When they get up, they practice what they uh, devised during the night. And they had the ability to do it. You know, there's probably a lot of people that would be more evil than what they are right now if they just had the power to do it. <clears throat> That's why I don't like giving politicians power because, you know, they stay up at night thinking how they can practice evil. <laughs> anyway, they covet fields and take them by violence. Um, also houses and seize them, so they oppress a man in his house a man and his inheritance. Now, when you take a man's house and his inheritance, you can do that by uh, force of arms, and maybe they did do that. But these people had uh, legal power, and they could do it by, by exercise of the law, unjustly applied, of course, but they still could 
do that, and they did. In verse 3, therefore, the Lord uh, says, uh, Behold, against this family I'm devising disaster from which you cannot remove your necks. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. Uh, nor shall you walk haughtily. When you, when you have your neck in a yoke, you can't be haughty. For this is an evil time. It's going to be a bad time for you. In that day, one shall take up a proverb against you and lament with a bitter lamentation to say, We are utterly destroyed. He has changed the heritage of my people. How he has removed it from me to a turncoat. He has divided our fields. And that's uh, what's going to happen. Those uh, heathen nations that that uh, come upon them are going to to utterly destroy them. Uh, they're going to change the inheritance of the people. They're not going to inherit what they think is rightly their, theirs. And by the time that they do return from captivity, some of them never will, they don't know who owns what. In verse 5, Therefore you shall have no one to determine boundaries by lot in the congregation of the Lord. And the boundaries, you know, when they came into the land of... Uh, and promised to them, they surveyed the land and assigned uh, to the different families and tribes and what have you, and established boundaries. And they somehow they uh, marked those boundaries, and the people were not allowed to move those boundaries. But here, these boundaries are going to be moved. So do not prattle, you say to those who prophesy. So they shall not prophesy to you. And this uh, prattling is just uh, preaching or uh, speaking to the people or, or doing what they call prophesying, divining, uh, divining uh, what have you. They shall not return. Uh, so they, pro they shall not prophesy to you. They shall not return insult for insult. There's not going to be any argument. There's no insult, and there's no counter-argument that, that can be offered. You who are named the house of Jacob, and that's both uh, Israel and, and uh, Judah, is the Spirit of the Lord restricted? Are these His doings? Do not my words do good to him who walks uprightly? <clears throat> Whatever the Lord says is going to happen. His purposes are going to be fulfilled. And his words, if one follows those words, do good. They don't do evil. But you have to walk uprightly. Walk uprightly is a manner of conduct and, and belief and, and practice. In verse 8, Lately my people have risen up as, a, as an enemy. You pull off the robe with a garment. <clears throat> Uh, you know, the American Standard really is, is uh, in, in terms of what's written, it's probably a better translation than New King Jane, but you might think they, when they pull off the road with a the garment, they're, they're just pulling off everything. They're not. They're pulling off the outer garment so that the inner garments, remember the inner garments, people consider that uh, uh, nude or naked when you just have the inner uh, inner garment. So they pull off the robe with a garment from those who trust you. They pass by. And you think about uh, in business transaction, you, there's got to be trust in business transaction. If there's no trust at all, you don't do business transactions. Now you, you say, well, we still have contracts and things like that. That's just the practical uh, aspects of any sort of business transaction because you want people to really understand uh, what the the uh, obligations of each party happens to be. But here, uh, from those who trust you as they pass by, those you should trust, they're doing this, they're pulling off the rope and what have you. Like men return from war, you know, they're pretty well tattered. The women of my people you cast out.
from their pleasant houses, from their children. You have taken away my glory forever. It just gives you an idea of what these people, these rich people are doing uh, in confiscating the material wealth from, from the uh, poor. Those pleasant houses with the children, they've been taken away. Arise and depart, in verse 10, for this is not your rest, because you, it is defiled, you shall, it shall destroy you, even with utter destruction. Again, it's an indication of what's coming. If a man should walk in a false spirit and speak a lie, saying, I will prophesy to you of wine and drink, and, and the wine and drink is uh, uh, a metaphor for plenty. They, they had plenty. Um, You see, even he would be the prattler of this people. It is not going to be true. If he says that you're going to have comfort and plenty and time's going to be great, he's lying to you. It's not going to happen. There is a time of punishment coming. Verse 12, I will surely assemble all of you, O Jacob, and I will surely gather the remnant of Israel. I will put them together like sheep in the fold, like a flock in the midst of their pasture. They shall make a loud noise because of so many men. Now this is a, uh, a view towards the restoration of the remnant. They're not going to be a a nation like they were. But there's going to be a remnant, remnant that's going to be brought back together. And they all, uh, they're going to be like a flock in the midst of their pasture. They're going to be together. They'll make a loud noise. And it says, because of so many men. It's not like so many men as it was before, but there will be a, a discreet number of people that are coming back that, you know, you can tell who they are. Verse 13, the one who breaks open and, and will come up before them, and they will break out, pass through the gate, and go out by it. And their king shall will pass before them with the Lord at their head. Now, this may be making reference to uh, the Davidic uh, kingdom. Of course, that kingdom... Christ is a representation of the Davidic kingdom that's being restored, but David's not being restored. It's a, a representation of what David was. And this breaking out, passing through the gate, the gate was a, a means of security. And that's going to be broken open. Well, that's the punishment that's coming. And their king could be the uh, king of, uh, it could be the Davidic line, it could be the, uh, talking about the uh, uh, heathen kings, that, that gonna, they're going to be uh, passed before them. But here it says the Lord's going to be their head, so it can't be the uh, heathen kings. It's got to be uh, of a messianic nature. In chapter 3, and I said, and it's the uh, Lord saying, Hear now, heads of Jacob, and you rulers of the house of Israel, is it not for you to know justice? Well, <laughs> should be. You who hate good and love evil, who strip the skin from my people and flesh from their bones, who eat the flesh of my people, flay their skin upon from them, break their bones, and chop them in pieces like meat for the pot, like flesh for the cauldron. That's a pretty dramatic uh, representation of what these people, these leaders, rich people, were doing to the uh, people of that country. You know, I doubt that they actually did that, but in a allegorical sense they were they were doing these sorts of things 
and it was a very evil exercise on their part. Then they will cry to the Lord. When they are taken off into captivity, they're going to cry to the Lord. Because really, these people don't think they're doing anything wrong. Because they've been blessed, you see. But he will not hear them. He will even hide his face from them at that time because they have done evil in their deeds. They can't escape that fact. Thus says the Lord concerning the prophets. You know, it's interesting in the, uh, at least in the Old Testament, I had to check the New Testament. Uh, these prophets are not the false prophets. They're never called false prophets. That uh, term never appears in the Old Testament. But he says concerning the prophets, well, we know they're false because they make my people stray. You chant peace when they uh, chew with their teeth. Now, this chewing with the teeth uh, can mean a number of different things, but it seems to me that these people are, are filled at the expense of these people. And it says, but who prepare war against him who puts nothing in their mouths? There's not going to be anything to put in their mouths, words or food or anything else, whenever this comes about. Therefore, you shall have night without vision. You shall have darkness without divination. The sun shall go down on the prophets, and that's these false prophets. And the day shall be dark for them. Well, day is where, when you have light, but it's still going to be dark to them. And they're going to have this being able to see things or, or proclaim things. Everything's going to be dark to them. And they're not going to be able to prophesy at all. And they're going to have a, a night, you know, visions, not necessarily coming at night, but you think of visions coming at night. They're going to have nights without vision. So the seer shall be, down verse 7, so the seer shall be ashamed. And seers is a, sort of another word for prophet. And the diviners are abashed. Indeed, they shall all cover their lips, for there is no answer from God. You know, when you cover your lips, you don't have anything to say. <laughs> so they're not going to be able to say anything. They don't have anything to say. For there's no answer from God. They're waiting on the answer. It doesn't come. So they've got nothing to say. But in verse 8, But truly I am full of power by the Spirit of the Lord and of justice and might to de declare to Jacob his transgression and to Israel his sin. And Jacob, again, is a uh, word that's used for both uh, the northern and southern kingdom, but Israel specifically the northern kingdom. So they're, they're both at uh, fault. And it's uh, the prophet that's full of power by the Spirit of the Lord. And he's exercising this authority by justice and, and might. And he's declaring, again it comes from the Lord, he's declaring Jacob's transgression and Israel's sin. And verse 9, we, it, there's a little change here. Now hear this, you heads of the house of Jacob and rulers of the house of Israel who abhor, abhor justice and pervert all equity, who build up Zion with bloodshed and Jerusalem with iniquity. Her heads judge for a bribe, her priests teach for pay, and her prophets divine for money. There's three different uh, uh, groups of people. Yet they lean on the Lord and say, It's not the Lord among us. No harm shall come, can come upon us. This is not an uncommon aspect of those that are in sin who are uh, materially well off. They think that because they are materially, materially well off that God has blessed them. And they must be right. You know, you don't get all this wealth and fortune if God's not on your side, right? But they do get it when God's not on their side, and God is not on their side. They've done all these things, 
And yet they say, is not the Lord among us? Therefore, in verse 12, Therefore, because of you, Zion shall be plowed like a field. Now, Zion is the uh, mountain on which uh, Jerusalem sits. It's got buildings on it. But they're going to be plowed like a field. So how can you plow a piece of land like a field when it's got buildings on it? The building's going to be torn down. Jerusalem shall become heaps of ruins. Because of that, you've got a place to plow. And the mountain of the temple, like the bare hills of the forest. Now, forest, of course, is we wouldn't think of it as bare. But it doesn't have any buildings on it. The forest doesn't have any buildings, so it... From that uh, aspect, it's bare. Now in chapter 4, we have the promise of the uh, coming kingdom. You can find this uh, almost almost verbatim in Isaiah, the second chapter. Now it should come to pass in the latter days. Now the latter days, when are the latter days? It's, it has to be referring to the uh, the uh, establishment of the church, the uh, uh, new covenant, new new covenant. That's going to be the latter days. That the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountains. This is a uh, 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 an area of prominence. It's going to stand out. And this is going to be established on the top of the mountains. Of course, you know, uh, not necessarily saying that mountain is Zion, but Zion is a mountain, but it's going to be so far above anything else. And shall be exalted above the hills. And people shall flow to it. Now, again, this doesn't, mean that this is going to be confined to Jerusalem, even though it, uh, we do uh, read that you know, Luke 24th chapter that it's going to start from Jerusalem, but it's going to spread all over the world. So this, many, people, many peoples are going to flow to it, uh, Gentiles and Jews. Many nations shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord. This place of prominence is going to be the new covenant, the church. Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord and to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways and we shall walk in his paths. Indeed, from Jerusalem, uh, these uh, apostles and whatever, they're going to be teaching the new ways of this new covenant. And many people are going to walk in uh, these paths. For out of Zion the law shall go forth. Now we, we've covered in class that you know we still have a law and this law going forth is going to be the law of Christ. It's going to go forth out of Zion. And the word of the Lord from Jerusalem and he shall judge but between many peoples and rebuke strong nations afar off. That's the nature of the gospel. It will judge people where they are and in the condition that they find themselves. They shall, they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. This kingdom, this new uh, thing that's going to be established on the, the mountains is not going to be established by force of arms. It's not going to be a feature of the, you know, the new kingdom, if you will. And it says, neither shall they learn war anymore. Well, of course we know that we've learned war <laughs> anymore. We've, I guess ever since uh, human history, we've, we've always had wars. And the establishment of the uh, church or the new covenant did not cause wars to cease but those that 
that are to be guided by this law that goes forth. War is not part of their way of thinking. Yes, they may be engaged in war, but and they don't use war to uh, expand the borders of this kingdom. It just doesn't happen. It has to be for the uh, souls and conscience of men, a voluntary type of obedience. But in verse 4 it says, But everyone shall sit under his vine and under his fig tree. Again, this is a uh, uh, euphemism, if you will, or an imagery of, of security, safety, peace, and it's used in a number of different places. And no one shall make them afraid. <clears throat> well, sometimes, you know, even even Christians are afraid. <laughs> There's no doubt. But it's the security that you have in Christ <clears throat> and the knowledge that you have that as long as you're faithful to Christ, you do not need to be afraid of the uh, scourge of, of sin. Yes, you may suffer physically. But you're not going to be afraid from a spiritual perspective. <clears throat> for the mouth of the Lord of hosts has spoken. For all people walk each in the name of his God. <clears throat> and, and that's uh, true today that most people walk in the name of their God, lowercase God either material things or if you go to other nations, uh, things that are not God, Buddha or Hindu religion or this, that, the other, or Islam, <clears throat> they're going to walk in the name of those gods. But we'll walk in the name of the Lord our God forever and ever. So this... Uh, uh, thing that's going to be established is going to last for all eternity, forever and ever. <clears throat> and we're going to walk in that. So in verse 6 it says, In that day, well what day is that? That's the, these latter days. In that day, says the Lord, I will assemble the lame, I will gather the outcast." And those whom I have afflicted, there's going to be a remnant that's coming back. I will make the lame a remnant and outcast a strong nation. So the Lord will reign over them in Mount Zion. This new spiritual Zion, the Lord's going to reign over them. From now on, even forever, this will be an eternal kingdom. It's not going to be destroyed. <clears throat> and you, O Tyre of the flock, the stronghold of the daughter of Zion, then this daughter of Zion or daughter of Jerusalem, what have you, is, is used a number of times. It uh, really means the uh, the people of Zion. And Tyre, the flock, you know, they, they, they used to erect towers over fields or pastures, what have you, so they can uh, keep an eye on the flock. <coughs> so God is going to keep watch over the flock. The stronghold of the daughter of Zion, to you shall it come. Even the former dominion shall come. Well, what is this former dominion? Well, it could be the Davidic uh, house. This is going to be, spiritually speaking, it's going to be established again. So that even the former dominion, uh, dominion shall come. The kingdom of the daughter of of Jerusalem, the kingdom of the people of Jerusalem. <clears throat> and why do you cry aloud? Is there no king in your midst? Has your counselor perished? Well, they, they don't have a king in their midst, so they're crying aloud. They don't have a counselor anymore. It's gone. For pangs have seized you like a woman in labor. And we're going to have to stay in labor until next week. 